good afternoon a very good afternoon everyone it's my pleasure to introduce uh, dr deepika for today's session uh, dr deepika is faculty from aims and uh, she has done her md and dm from aims only md in pediatrics and dm in neurology from aims she has more than 10 publications 10 chapters contribution to neonatal nursing module and at present she is faculty in on top for doctors and nurses and i know i have seen her personally her interest uh, for teaching particularly nurses during her rounds so a very warm welcome dr deepika and i welcome you for this session and the today's topic is on clepsy and i request the participant to uh keep on uh, asking in chat box or in question answer session whatever queries they have over to you uh, deepika thank you sister meena uh, for this opportunity and i thank nnf for uh, this opportunity to teach the nursing officers uh, all across the country for this very important topic that i will cover so i will just share my screen is my screen visible yes yeah it's visible so good afternoon all uh, so today my the topic of my presentation is uh, central line associated blood stream infections or short in short called as clapsy so we will be discussing this very important topic in our daily day to day activity because we deal with being a low and low and medical middle income country we deal with infections in and out and being intensivists in uh, neonatology we also deal with so many central lines be it pick line be it umbilical line or any other uh, central line that we usually see so this is a very important topic in our day to day practice and we will try to understand uh, what are the mechanisms and what are the what is the definition and how can we actually prevent infection as prevention is very very important for decreasing infections in the icu and these hospital acquired infections contribute to a major cause of mortality in nicus in country like ours so yeah so the outline of this presentation will be introduction to the problem then the pathophysiology in brief of the what is the uh, mechanisms that are leading to this blood stream infection which is so peculiar with the central line in c2 and what is the definition and the what is the operational definition that we will follow what are the risk factors that we need to be aware of uh, especially in neonates where they are more predisposed to clapsy what are the treatment modalities and the preventive strategies and a few words about surveillance and how to monitor the clapsy uh, uh, clapsy occurrence in our setting so coming to introduction about uh, so central line placement has increased very low birth weight survival to a great extent central lines are used in and out uh, with safe administration of uh, hyperosmolar fluids and medications uh, so these allow for uh, so much high inotropes high amount of fluids parental nutrition these medications to go safely into the neonate intravenously without any hazardous complications related to osmolarity however the neonates are already pre predisposed with an immature immunity especially the ones which are small and sick with so many invasive procedures going on and they have a frequent contact with hospital personnel which can actually lead to, which can actually transmit so many infections that they are harboring so what is a central line a central line is an intravascular catheter that terminates at or close to the heart or in one of the great vessels that is used for infusion withdrawal of blood or hemodynamic monitoring so this is the definition given by the uh, center for disease control in 2021 and the national health surveillance network which clearly defines what is a central line it is very important that a line should be used for infusion as i have highlighted here for withdrawal of blood and for hemodynamic monitoring lines like pacemaker wires or transducers where nothing is used as an infusion is not considered as a central line so routinely we see umbilical catheters be it arterial or venous pick line which is peripherally inserted central line and femoral or subclavian central catheters which we are routinely inserting in our nicus so these are all examples of central line and anything discussion beyond here will will be will be 
according to these lines, which we will we will discuss. So what are the complications of a central line? So any line or any foreign body in the in the natural system of a human being, here it is a neonate, uh, is not free of complications. So any any foreign body will invite so many react so much reaction in the form of thrombosis, uh, in the form of hemorrhage because of the predisposition for bleeding in these neonates, for arrhythmias because it is lying very close to the heart and can lead to conduction abnormalities. They can also lead to effusions because of uh, fluid being infused and the cavities being breached. It can also lead to portal hypertension if it is inserted very close to the liver, example in a umbilical venous catheter. They can rupture inside the body, being it a foreign body, it's a plastic material, it can rupture. And the most important of them is infection. So for the purpose of this seminar, we will be discussing only the infection-related complications of a central line. Although every complication is important and if prevented, it can, it can give great dividends. But we will discuss regarding infection relating to a central line. So what is the pathophysiology? How does this bloodstream infection occur with the central line? So there are many, many ways by which infection can reach or the organisms can reach the uh, central uh, line. Uh, so it can be either external catheter surface colonization, it can be internal catheter surface colonization, it can be intrinsic contamination, or it can travel through blood from a distant site as in hematogenous seeding. So as we can see in this diagram, so this is the central line which is inserted and this is the skin surface where it has breached and we have pricked the neonate here and the central line is inserted into the vein. So any cath, so this is like a catheter. So we can see that a contaminated catheter hub, so it a hub can be contaminated from inside which is called the intrinsic contamination or the outer surface of the hub which is the extrinsic contamination so intrinsic will mostly be the uh, the extrinsic and intrinsic both will come from the healthcare workers hands and will be contaminated with the skin flora of the healthcare workers then the then this was the external and internal catheter surface colonization then the, um, then the fluids that we're infusing, like the, the, the IV fluids, then parental nutrition, then medications, since inotropes, and so many fluids that we are infusing through the central catheter can also be contaminated. So contaminated infusate also forms one of the sources of clepsy. The third important source is the hematogenous infection. So an infection elsewhere in the body can travel through the bloodstream to the local site where the catheter is in place and can lead to colonization of the catheter and widespread dissemination of the bacteria causing clepsy. So there are four major mechanisms. As I said, one is external catheter, one is internal catheter surface colonization, then intrinsic contam contamination of the fluids that we're infusing and hematogenous seeding from a distant site. Now, why do we think that this bloodstream infection, this central line is so prone to this bloodstream infection? Why are we so worried about it? Because there is a concept called the biofilm. So any foreign body, especially in the, in the terms of central line, will invite a lot of bacteria there and will lead to a formation of layers and layers of organisms leading to a very thick structure and a layer or a coating around the uh, surface of the central line which is called the biofilm. So this biofilm is actually not nothing but bacteria, which are live bacteria, which are embedded within an extracellular matrix on the catheter surface. The interesting point or the dangerous point is that this biofilm can start developing as early as 24 hours of insertion of a central line. And these are nothing but organisms on the skin of the neonate. And they're mostly colonizing the external surface in the first phase. And then later with the prolonged use of NICU, typically over 10 days of the central line, the inner surface also starts colonizing and due to a frequent disconnection and connection of the hub. So this biofilm is actually our target when we are trying to prevent or treat the uh, clapsy. So why is this biofilm so much concern? There are so many bacteria embedded in an extracellular matrix, we can very well kill it with antibiotic. But no, the problem is that the bacteria inside these, uh, this biofilm have become less susceptible to antibiotics. They have a very low metabolic rate so that antibiotics cannot kill them. And they have a minimal inhibitory concentration, which is a marker of the antibiotic resistance, up to 10, almost 1,000 times higher. And this biofilm is so thickly concentrated with the extracellular matrix or the material that in which they are embedded that it is highly impenetrable to antibiotics. 
So antibiotics, even if we continue and even if it is timely, it will be very difficult to treat this collapse or kill this bacteria with the routine antibiotics. So a very important concept of the removal of device and as early as possible is a very important concept in the management of collapse. And the organisms that are implicated are the routine organisms that we see in the skin flora. One is the cons that are universal colonizers and any, in any NICU we go that we will find a cons waiting for us. And the methicillin sensitive Staph aureus, then methicillin resistant Staph aureus, enterococci, and fungi like candida and gram negative organisms. So these organisms are commonly found in the uh, neonates with clapsy and in the catheters that are colonized, which stay for a long time. So it is very important to understand this concept of biofilm. I will not go into the details of this concept because they are complex, but we will have to understand this. This biofilm is our target when we are treating and preventing the clapsy. So after understanding the steps that are involved in the pathogenesis of clapsy, how do we define clapsy? We will have to define it to treat it and to prevent it. So how do we define it? So very easy definition was provided by uh, CDC uh, 2021, which was also adapted by National Health Surveillance Network, in which a line, if it was placed for more than two consecutive days, uh, after the first access, it becomes eligible for CLAPSI, which means that a line is placed on day zero after the baby is admitted until day three of admission, the line is still in place and it has been continuously used for uh, continuously used for the uh, infusion. So it has to be accessed. It is not that a line in place and nothing has been done with it, it becomes eligible. So there are two important points. One is at least two days and it has to be accessed continuously uh, following the first access for uh, it being eligible for CLAPSI. So CLAPSI can be either a colonization or it can be, so catheter related infections can be either colonization or catheter associated infection. A colonization is nothing but a layer of organism which is sitting there and not causing infection or a bloodstream infection. So there will be no, uh, no signs, no clinical, uh, uh, clinical worsening or any signs of infection in a neonate. And uh, there is a significant growth of microorganisms, but it is not causing any signs in the neonate. So it is only colonization. It is not infection. For infection, we will need some clinical signs also. So the CDC provides, although we have a very few uh, studies which actually delve into the neonatal CLAPSI, and I will try to give a simpler definition for routine uses in NICU so that there is no complexity involved and the an operational definition is being followed. So a patient who is less than one year, at least uh, less than one year of age, in which we, in this case, it is a neonate, has at least one of the following. So either a fever or a hypothermia or apnea or bradycardia. And along with this clinical scenario or a suspicion of bloodstream infection, we have an organism who is identified in the blood and is not related to infection at the other side. This is very important for, for understanding the definition of CLAPSI that the organism should not be identified at any other site. So it should be identified in the blood and it should be within three within seven days infectious window period. That means that these clinical features and the blood culture should be within seven days, meaning that if a blood culture is taken on day, day three of uh, admission, so these features should be present within the three days prior and three days later, if they're presenting, it will be considered as symptoms relating to CLAPSI. Uh, so this is a very easy definition that within three days prior or three days later than the blood culture is taken, if these clinical features are present, and there is an organism which is growing in the blood, it is very well possible that it is a uh, clapsy and a bloodstream infection. Along with it, uh, important, def important part of the definition is that with an indwelling central line, as we discussed, the culture should be confirmed uh, with the bacterial or fungal pathogen, which we have already discussed. The patient has clinical symptoms of sepsis, which we uh, have again discussed. But a very important point is that a common commensal should be identified in two separate blood cultures because we know that a colonization can also occur and it is possible the child is symptomatic for another uh, for some another condition. So a common commensal should be identified in two separate blood cultures. So in a two separate meaning two separate blood cultures in time. So it should be two separate blood cultures which show the same commensal and uh, along with clinical features and an indwelling central line in between that window period of seven days. So then that is considered as a clapsy. And uh, if it is only by one culture along with, it has to be associated with some inflammatory marker elevation uh, like CRP, which is more than 10 milligram per liter. 
so this is also one of the uh, this is not a very widely used definition uh, for this commensal story but this has been recently given by the by a new uh, criteria in netherlands and i thought it will be important to to tell here because commensals are one of the common organisms which are implicated in clapsy so if we get two separate blood cultures growing a commensal or a single blood culture with inflammatory markers raised that will also classify for clapsy so after understanding the definitions, uh, which babies are more predisposed? We know that neonates are more predisposed, but which are the particular neonates or particular factors which we should consider while uh, classifying the neonates at risk of clapsy? So as we can see here, a lower gestation, a lower birth weight by itself uh, is more predis predisposed for clapsy because of lower immunity and low, uh, higher, uh, higher sickness levels and more prolonged stay in the ICU. More need for flu fluids, more needs for parental medications and more needs for parental nutrition. The type of catheter is also important. Uh, there is, uh, it is said that femoral catheter is more prone to clapsy. However, it is seen that umbilical catheters are also as likely as uh, uh, femoral and they are almost 1.5 to 2 times higher risk of clapsy uh, as compared to other catheters. And umbilical and femoral are more prone for clapsy. Then history of prior antibiotic exposure. If there is a previous history of antibiotic exposure, it is possible that there are more organisms and more resistant organisms coming to the uh, catheter site uh, with the indwelling catheter and predisposing for a uh, worse form of clapsy. Then a babies who are NPO with no uh, enteral feeding being given, they will need more parental nutrition and they will have less immunity because of uh, feeds being not being given. So they are also predisposed for clapsy. Then babies on prolonged mechanical ventilation, prolonged PN, the most consistent that is a uh, risk factor which has been shown to be directly associated with clapsy, independent of other factors is the duration. So the longer the duration, the higher the chances of clapsy. And this brings in a very important concept of removing the central line whenever not indicated, which I will discuss in detail in the preventive strategies. So whenever we think that the line is not required, it should be removed without a second thought. So it is very important for review of the duration of the lines and they should not be sitting for days together without any uh, significant purpose. And a duration nutrition for more than two weeks is also uh, a significant risk factor. So coming to the management of clapsy. So management uh, lies in the prevention. So in neonatology, we understand that sepsis is all about preventing uh, the occurrence of sepsis. Once sepsis has occurred, it is not a very difficult job to give antibiotic. Uh, but in that scenario, we increase the sepsis-related mortality. We increase the antibiotic usage. We increase the antibiotic-related adverse events. And we also increase the occurrence of antimicrobial resistance. So nothing can work more better than preventing it at the first go. So I will not, uh, I will, uh, we will mo focus more on the preventive, preventive strategies of CLAPSI in this session, because as nursing officers, it is a very important concept to understand what, in what way we can prevent the occurrence of infection, because we are routinely handling as health line, healthcare workers and frontline workers being bedside at the uh, bedside with the baby. We are routinely handling the lines. We know we should know how to handle the line, how to care the skin, how to care for the site, how to uh, encourage hand hygiene by all the uh, healthcare workers, and how to identify at the slightest sign that a clapsy. It is possible that the baby has uh, is harboring a bloodstream infection and timely treating it. So I will focus more on the prevention because that is the most important management strategy for any hospital-acquired infection, and in this case, CLAPSI. So for prevention, so we talked about the pathophysiology, that how the biofilm works. Then we also talked about what are the risk factors. So why are we talking about all this? Because we need to understand all the factors that are actually predisposing to CLAPSI. Because if we, we have to understand all the factors because we have to prevent all the factors. If we don't identify the root cause of a problem, uh, we will never be able to solve it. So we will have to identify which are the modifiable factors, which are the non-modifiable factors. And if they're modifiable, to what extent they're modifiable and how what we can do to actually improve the rates of CLAPSI in our unit or in uh, for that matter, hospital acquired infection for our unit. So I think we are all uh, slightly at least aware of the quality improvement approach. So this was a beautiful paper in which there was a statewide quality improvement collaborative to reduce this clapsies. So this is a, a fishbone diagram or the root cause analysis. So I will not go into the details because that is a separate discussion altogether. So we will just see that the factors that are actually leading to CLAPSI are mostly divided into care with giver related factors, 
patient related factors system and supplier related factors and equipment related factors and we can see there is a number of organisms number of uh, reasons that are actually contributing to the occurrence of clapsy which our which is our outcome so in their study and i think this study can be a very beautiful example to on how to adapt this kind of approach for identifying the various causes in our in your unit which are leading to infection uh, so in caregiver related factors we uh, they saw that the site insertion was uh, mostly femoral there was improper sampling there was poor skin care there was poor site care the hub care was not appropriate they were not compliant with hand hygiene there was a poor compliance with dressing change and dressings were soiled altogether without uh, anyone seeing it and during insertion the aseptic techniques were not followed so writing down here <coughs> i'm sorry so writing down all these factors here uh, brings into picture the major causes where we can act where we can train we can educate the healthcare staff and improve the processes that are actually leading to the outcome which is clapsy there are some patient related factors like the baby has fecal incontinence or diarrhea then there is some colonization with resistant organism then system related fact uh, factors like policy and procedure is required there is no policy uh, for uh, how to put a central line in the unit so it is very important to have these in place there is a reuse of collection devices without proper cleaning and there is a deficient housekeeping also equipment like there is catheter securing devices are not available and catheters are loose and they are being and they are uh, attaching with the, they are uh, coming in contact with the skin so these are very important factors and here we can see that most of them are mostly modifiable so if we improve the sum of the processes and we understand what is a proper technique or the proper uh, processes that we need to follow it will uh, give us great dividends and it might help us re reduce the clapsy rates in our unit so understanding all these factors uh, there are five evidence based steps to prevent clapsy so if you don't remember anything from my class today these are the five things that i need you to remember when you go home or to go to your unit so one is a full barrier precaution during central venous catheter this is very very important because uh, if you are putting a line and in that scenario only if we inject and if we infuse an infection or a bacteria into the system then after that the battle is lost so even if we do whatever site care whatever antibiotics whatever uh, daily surveillance the battle is lost so while inserting the central venous catheter we should have full barrier precautions then appropriate skin care appropriate site care hand hygiene i cannot emphasize more hand hygiene has its own dividends it the decrease every every type of infection in the unit and a good compliance to hand hygiene is a very good process indicator to see whether the infection what is the infectious rate of infections rate of any nic and the fifth and the most important point is remove any unnecessary catheters so these are the five points which we need to remember that <coughs> clapsy is very well preventable and if we follow these five steps we will not be we don't have to struggle with our clapsy rates and there also comes the role of clapsy care bundles so what are care bundles i will discuss it after a while first we go every uh, step one step at a time uh, so for, we know that full barrier precautions have to be followed during catheter insertion so what is appropriate skin care so as we can see before inserting any central venous catheter or any peripheral arterial catheter and changing the dressing it is very important to disinfect the skin with either of these either a chlorhexidine uh, based uh, solution or an iodine based solution or iodophore or a 70% alcohol so we at our unit are typically using uh, using this uh, betadine uh, cleaning or uh, it it can be a basic 70% uh, alcohol cleaning and we are not using chlorhexidine because in neonates although it is wide, uh, very widely used everywhere in the western countries also but chlorhexidine has its safety issues in neonates and in neonates we are not using and it is also not recommended to use less than 2 months of age so we are using uh, betadine or uh, we are using alcohol based solutions and not chlorhexidine solutions although they are they are being used in many units so we have to be very very careful of the skin care that we are providing now this is the most important concept that we need to understand and we need to ingrain it into our dna as nursing officers because when we are handling the site of the hub we have to do scrubbing the hub technique so it is a 15 second scrub uh, and 15 second drying so here we can see we are scrubbing the hub for 15 seconds and we are 15 seconds drying uh, drying the uh, hub for 15 seconds so this 30 seconds scrub the hub, hub technique 
has been proved to be very, very useful and extremely crucial for decreasing the CLAPSI rates. So why do we need to scrub the hub? So as I read, as I told you in pathophysiology, there is a biofilm that is that is uh, present on the uh, hub. So it can be either on the internal surface or it can be either on the external surface based on the duration of the central line. So as it is a thick film with a lot of extracellular matrix and a layer, so it cannot be clean like normally. If you normally clean like we put some solution and we just gently clean it, it is possible that the biofilm may not be clean and it might not be uh, removed from there. So we will have to scrub it. So we typically scrub it like this, 15 seconds scrub, right? And then we let it dry. So it has to be a vigorous scrub and not a very gentle, gentle cleaning. That is the most important point for hub care that I need you all to remember. So as we can see here, this is the hub and the healthcare professional is cleaning it. And we have a very, uh, we have a alcohol soaked or a, a chlorhexidine soaked uh, this uh, swab or this, uh, the, this uh, dressing. And then you clean it and then we rotate it. We cover it, we cover the whole hub in a layer with, the, with this dressing. And then it's uh, impregnated with alcohol or with spirit or betadine, whatever we are using. And we also clean the solution. So we also clean the ports. So any hub where the fluid is connected or which is used for changing or uh, disconnecting and connecting and again and again, we need to scrub the hub. So the rule of today is scrub the hub, which we need to remember and we need to practice every day when we handle the central lines. <laughs> so after I discussed with you the five key points for CLAPSI prevention, I come to a concept which is bundle. So what is a care bundle? A bundle is actually a set of interventions, which are a specific set of structured interventions, which will improve the patient outcomes when they are implemented collectively. So the key words here are structured interventions. They cannot be just any interventions. And second is implemented collectively. So they are not a sequential implementation that one is leading to the other. So they are actually collectively implemented and they have to be very consistently implemented to actually show improvement in the processes or improvement in the CLAPSI rates. So the main care, so any care bundle, there are various care bundles that are uh, um, available in healthcare for CLAPSI prevention, but they all focus on three major concerns. One is the hand hygiene has to be optimal. Second is optimization of the central venous catheter care, uh, including skin care, hub care, insertion bundles, maintenance bundles. And the third is surveillance and communication. So whatever we do, we will have to report it and we have to communicate our results also so that it helps in understanding the rates of CLAPSI over time. So these three are the critical components of a CLAPSI care bundle. So there are many examples uh, in various units, uh, Western and in India, but this can be a simple CLAPSI care bundle, which is uh, adapted from the AIMS uh, New Delhi, uh, in which we can see we have all the components that we were discussing, the five key components in this bundle. So we do a proper hand hygiene. We do proper maximum barrier precaution while inserting central line. We do proper skin antisepsis when we drape the whole body and do not leave any skin uh, exposed apart from the area of interest. We do daily review of line necessity. This is again very important. I'm emphasizing it again and again. And we have optimal catheter site selection and we are avoiding femoral uh, line in adults and in neonates also it is recommended to avoid it. But uh, umbilical lines also, although they are associated with higher risk of CLAPSI, but it is a very good central line choice. So we continue using umbilical lines uh, for a few days and later replace them with pick lines. And we scrub the hub. So this is the one slide that actually gives you a good CLAPSI care bundle where all the critical elements are in place. And if you don't uh, implement them collectively, we might not be able to improve uh, the CLAPSI rates. Another type of bundle, which is slightly more complex is like, again, grouped into a general, like optimized hand hygiene, then monitor the compliance and feeding practices. It is good to, uh, uh, to uh, initiate early feeding for many other reasons, including CLAPSI prevention. Then infusion practices that PN should be infused in a particular ratio, then fluids should be infused in a particular osmolarity, and it should be very critical to look at the osmolarity or the quality of the infusion uh, that we are using. Management of central line, then guidelines for their necessity, whether they can be removed today, then the answer is yes, we remove it ASAP. Then the disinfection practices like the skin preparation should be in place, the volume of blood that we need to test the uh, CLAPSI rates should be important. Then antibiotic stewardship, because we said that there is factor in risk factors, it is, so these are all the risk factors that we said. 
So in risk factors, we saw that antibiotics uh, usage in the uh, um, period before the occurrence of CLABSI was actually associated with increased risk of uh, CLABSI with resistant organisms. So there should be a clear guidelines in the unit for antibiotic therapy initiation and discontinuation. There should be clear surveillance for colonization. And there should be isolation and precautions for the patients who are actually colonized with antibiotic resistant organisms. So mostly in our centers or in the country like ours, we some centers do have guidelines for antibiotic initiation and we usually try to follow those guidelines. But most of our units are lacking in the surveillance for colonization because it is a mostly not a cost effective process. But be, but if possible, we should do as much as we can to actually track the progress of these colonization rates and understand from where the CLAPSI is coming from and what are the rates in our unit. Then infection accountings. We should have real-time data for central lines. We should have real-time data for uh, the culture results. And we should always, always do a root cause analysis as I just depicted using a fishbone diagram at the time of any late onset sepsis, whether it was actually related to central line and whether something could have been done to improve it. So this is an ex extensive and an exhaustive checklist or a bundled approach, which, uh, which can be uh, adapted or adopted in a unit to monitor and prevent CLAPSI. So this is one of the central line checklists that we follow at our NICU at Ames, New Delhi. And here we can see that we have the details, demographic details, and we have the size of the catheter and the type of the catheter. And uh, a nursing officer will stand beside the bedside and uh, the resident doctor will be uh, inserting the line and uh, they will be constantly checking whether these steps are being diligently followed. And uh, if not, then they will, be, they will interrupt and tell them to follow first and then go ahead with each step. So this is a very useful checklist to understand and to keep up with these steps in order and nothing uh, uh, ensure that nothing is missed. Apart from this checklist before insertion, we also have a daily review mechanism of central line uh, of the integrity of the central line. And here we can see, I hope that you are able to see this. We have this IV site. So whether it is okay or where there is swelling. So if there is a pick line where there is a swelling, if there is an umbilical line where there is a discharge or if there is not working. So there the nurse officer will write uh, at each vital examination whether the line is okay or not. So this helps us to understand whether a line is there or not, whether a line is uh, in, uh, functioning or not, and whether there is a problem and it needs to be removed. And it also helps to calculate the number of central line days to uh, address the issues of duration of central line and the need for their removal. So once we understand that these are the, all the steps that are required, they look very fancy, they look very easy, uh, that we can do, that we can do, that we can do, but actually they're not happening at the ground level. So what is stopping us? We need to educate, we need to train more healthcare professionals in these appropriate practices at the bedside so that the CLAPC actually reduces. And these need to be told uniformly everywhere. So the key concern, the key strategy should be education and training of the healthcare professionals in CLAPC care. And there was a study which shows beautifully reduction in CLAPSI rates after it was, after an extensive educative efforts were uh, given and uh, the training was imparted to the healthcare professionals. And uh, the CLAPSI rates actually significantly reduced from 16.7 per thousand to 5.1 uh, per thousand central line days. So this is not in their unit. It can decrease in anyone's unit and it is not very it is not very difficult, but it needs to be very diligently and sincerely done projects. And uh, it has to be inculcated in the mindset of the healthcare workers that are working in that unit that we have to follow these five or six evidence-based practices and we need to have a proper SOP in place for the unit. And this, this study actually uh, ends and concludes that uh, it is an actual preventable medical error and it is not an unavoidable complication. We cannot sit on our hands uh, and say that, okay, CLAPSI ho gaya, koi baat nahi. But we will have to see that it is a preventable medical error and we can do, uh, we should do whatever we can to prevent it. So after uh, understanding the management strategies, a word about surveillance. Uh, so I will not go into the very uh, uh, complex details of the surveillance, but there are some ratios which are useful for any unit or for national surveillance or international surveillance for adequate reporting of CLAPSI. One is a standardized infection ratio and one is a standardized utilization rate. So standardized infection ratio is actually how many uh, CLAPSIs were observed and how many CLAPSIs were actually predicted for that unit. 
right so there is a, a database which exists in the western countries where this prediction can happen and they unit wise prediction have been uh, provided but unfortunately these systems are not there for our country or our nicus but at least that we can do is have some number that we have at least a monthly number or a a uh, quarterly or a three monthly number that we can say, okay, these many collapses occurred and this is our baseline rate. If it is high for a unit, we can try to reduce it and see the real improvement in a few months after implementing the improvement practices. And it is very important to report because uh, it has to it, it can also help us compare the units and to see why one unit is doing better than the other. And it can also promote transparency and accountability of that unit and can help understand what are the factors in particular to that unit, why collapse rates are higher or they are lower. Then there is another standardized utilization rate, which actually tracks the device, meaning how much number of days were actually the lines were placed. And this can also come from daily routine charts. And But we don't have any, I think, central uh, reporting facility for this. But this national health surveillance networks and uh, organizational bodies like CDCs are recommending use of these ratios in the daily practice. But the small step that we can do from today is at least track the number of central lines that are being uh, inserted and for how many days they are being inserted. And we can easily put this parameter in our nursing chart in any NICU. And this is not a very difficult task. So we can start from small steps and then understand these ratios and then maybe uh, take up to the higher levels. So surveillance is very, very important. Uh, and uh, we cannot go in uh, collapse prevention and management without surveillance. So I end my session here uh, saying that CLAPSI is a common occurrence and uh, preventive strategies are offering a significant benefit. And I cannot, cannot overemphasize hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is the most crucial step that we need to follow diligently, religiously at every moment that we need to do hand hygiene before and after touching the patient and before and after any procedure. And appropriate skin and line care are essential and especially as a care bundle if possible but scrubbing the hub is very very important and skin antisepsis goes a long way and we need to review daily the need for a line and discontinue whenever possible and an active surveillance system can help us in the long run to understand what is happening in our nic thank you i will be happy to answer any questions thank you dr deepika for such a wonderful session and thank before you, uh, we open for the audience for the participant i have a query like i have seen you when you are putting um with clients so you used to change gloves yes so at what time you use you change gloves like can you please explain Yes. So uh, the, in the in uh, in our unit, when we are actually putting the lines, uh, first of all, we uh, uh, do a very diligent hand rub, uh, hand wash, and then we drape the, we prepare all the sterile tray, whatever procedure, whatever um, we we first we don the glove, first we wash the hands, we don the gloves, then we prepare the tray into which the center line is there, all the requirements are there, we then we clean the skin area and uh, drape the area of interest and then we change the glove before putting a line thank you so much so i just want to tell the uh, participant that see it is very important as a nurse that we have to keep the things well in time ready like we have to keep the tra uh, tray or the trolley containing all the articles required for the insertion of pick line along with this a checklist is to be kept there and one nurse sitting and checking the um, things, like whether a hand hygiene is done or not, sterile, the gloves is changed or not. So all these things are very, very important to keep an eye on the procedure. Yes, it is going according to the checklist. And one of the most important things which I want to tell is that once a catheter is inserted, whether it is umbilical venous catheter, so we check it, uh, whether it is in position or not. Or suppose you find that it is inserted extra and you have to take it out for 0.5 centimeter or one centimeter. Uh, it is okay, you can take it out, but reinserting of the same catheter is not done in our unit or I think is not done anywhere in the um, um, hospital because it, then it causes infection. So it is very important to remember that, yes, you can pull out the extra length, but pulling the same catheter in is not recommended anywhere. And as Dr. Deepika has very well uh, you know, emphasizes, emphasized on the importance of hand hygiene. So it is very important to follow the five steps and the 12 um, moments of, you know, five moments of hand hygiene and 12 steps of hand hygiene. And it is important when you are going to um, do a procedure to, to do hand washing. And now Dr. 
Um, Monica, I would, like to, sister, I would like to emphasize one more thing again that central line insertion should not be done in a hurry. Yeah, that exactly. is the most important step. The it should never be done in a hurry. We always have five minutes in our life. We should always be very slow and be very religious and meticulous in putting a central line because it will stay for days together in a neonate and it may cause infection and it it could have been easily prevented. That is a very important point that we need to emphasize. Dr. Manisha, please. Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Deepika. Uh, excellent talk. And uh, uh, you have covered uh, every um, detail, uh, every every step in detail, uh, which is very important to understand. And I think um, it's, it's important that we keep revising ourselves and reminding ourselves on time to time basis that uh, if, if anything of these steps we, we may be missing uh, when uh, as a part of our routine uh, process. So keeping a checklist, ensuring that it is done, it is followed, and uh, the simple steps of when to change the gloves, everything, I think it has been very, it would be definitely very useful to all our uh, nursing officers who have joined today and who have been doing it, uh, who must have been assisting in uh, doing it uh, in their own units time again time and again because that is this is one of the commonest process pro procedure which is done in most of the NICUs and then how to manage maintain it how to maintain and then when to remove all these things will need to be remembered while in order to prevent um, neonatal sepsis so thank you so much for you know for this excellent talk uh, yeah there is some question uh uh, yeah, so if there are any questions to be asked, thanks, James. Thank you, Jubilant. Yeah, so any other questions? Uh, uh, if you want to put in the Q&A box, you all are most welcome. Or if you want anything else to be discussed with regards to CLEPSI, um, bundle approach. Yeah. Uh, so if there is anything that needs to be discussed, please put your questions over here. I mean, I, I don't think I, there would be any questions because you have covered most of it. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but no but no questions at the end means either they were sleeping or I was very boring. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add two, one or two points, Dr. Deepika. Like, uh, like it's like removal of umbilical venous catheter and umbilical arterial catheter. As per CDC, uh, the recommendation is for seven days, but whenever it goes more than 10 days, so we have to be very careful, then the chances of, you know, colonization increases. So whenever possible, uh, the USC and the UVC should be out within seven days. And um, is it correct? Yes, so the thing is that for central lines, we have different duration recommendations for different lines. For umbilical venous catheter, it can be kept for uh, seven days. And for umbilical arterial, it can be kept for slightly longer. But the issue is that even if they can be kept longer, that is not important. Important is if you think they are not required, they should be yeah. removed. Yeah. So there is no days that is the, of course, there is an upper limit. But it can be still be removed on day two, day three. We are typically saying as doctors also, sometimes we are worried ki nahi, I'm, I'm sure everyone is uh, versatile with Hindi. So we are saying that we have to keep it for a day, we don't know if it's going to be or not. So that is not the correct approach. So even if it is required, it can be reinserted anywhere else. So we should be very confident in removing because this really, really inflates the risk of clapsy. Thank you. So we can remove as early as possible and uh, definitely uh, beyond seven days and 14 days for USC and UBC. Yeah, there is a question from uh, Jubilant James regarding uh, skin safety issues yes. with chlorhexidine. So uh, Jubilant, the problem with uh, chlorhexidine is not with skin safety. It is with the absorption of chlorhexidine and neurotoxicity concerns. So chlorhexidine uh, is actually a potent neurotoxin and for neonates that we are handling, like preterm neonates, immunodeficient neonates, low birth weight neonates, in them, the neurotoxicity is a real concern. So uh, there have been reports of neurotoxicity. That is why it is not approved for use. Although because for, for babies who are less than 28, less than 1 kg, so their betadine also has an issue. So we typically don't use, I not use either betadine or chlorhexidine. We are only cleaning with uh, spirit. 
or saline. So because there the skin is so immature that we are not using anything. So chlorhexidine, although it is upcoming and the studies are being done to, uh, to establish their safety as a neurotoxin, but there are concerns and uh, we at our center are not using chlorhexidine. Thank you. Madam Pavel? Yeah, just one thing regarding use of betadine. I think we just need to be careful that we don't leave. Once we apply betadine and then we clean it off with using alcohol, just make sure that we don't leave it behind on the skins because it's and a it, Yes, yes. Thank you for bringing that out. Yeah. And it, it should be very, very small amount. It should not be a liberal amount. Yeah. And what we used to do, we use at our center is we, uh, we have a forceps in which we are actually uh, putting the swab, very small cotton here. And then we dip it in uh, the betadine and then we try to squeeze it for a while so that all the excess betadine goes out from that swab and then we use it on the baby's skin because the more you use it the more it has tendency of absorption first of all and second being a skin irritant and cause burns so betadine should also be very carefully used in babies who are specifically less than 32 and less than 28 weeks yeah, yeah. any other questions And very importantly, you said that whatever fluid we are withdrawing from the bottle, that should be uh, clean with triple swab technique. And the most important thing is that once you clean, let it dry. Do not blow air from your mouth or uh, something to dry the, let it take its own time. So 15 seconds, yeah. So 15, uh, yes, uh, scrub the half, 15 seconds scrubbing and 15 seconds dry is important. And same way, when you are opening any TPN bottle or IV fluid bottle, first clean with spirit, followed by bitter in, then again with spirit and then use it. So these might only take 15, 20 seconds extra, but these are real, real processes which can help. Yeah. Madam Parul, would you like to add something or Dr. Kirti? Mm -hmm. No, many, many thanks to Dr. Deepika. It was an excellent presentation. Yes, I think you. I have also learned some important aspect also about especially the chlorhexidine because we are recommending for use of chlorhexidine, but yes. there, that, uh, that the, there can have some neurotoxicity. And yes. uh, one thing that um, uh, for betadine, uh, how long we can keep the betadine on the skin? Whether, when we'll remove with alcohol? So, so one that's the key here. Yeah, so for a sepsis techniques, it is typically recommended for 60 seconds. So for mm -hmm. one minute, the betadine should be kept and after that it should be removed with alcohol. But the important mm -hmm. point is because we don't know how much amount, there is no recommendation for amount of betadine. Mm -hmm. So we tend it, we, there is a tendency for overuse of betadine and a lot of betadine, yes. betadine being spilled on the skin. And being mm -hmm. irritant, it can really cause burns in the baby's skin. Okay, so thank you. And uh, I think all the uh, participants, they should follow these uh, latest and standard guidelines, especially for the bundle approach. And they should stick on hand hygiene, skin preparation, and uh, some surveillance activities like that, all that, and site care like that all. So yes. then only these, uh, the most important uh, complications of the PIC in our uh, central line can be controlled. Thank you, Dr. Deepika. Thank you, Dr. Deepika. It was excellent. Thank you. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, I think three. Dr. Uh, Dr. Deepika, can you tell us, like in our unit, less than 28 weeks, how we do skin preparation? So do we, we use betadine? We don't use betadine. Oh, just for, uh, with 70% isopropyl alcohol. Yes, betadine. yes, yes. We do it yeah. thrice. We do it, uh, we do it twice. In place of betadine, we use a sec extra step of spirit, but we don't use betadine. Yeah. They're very fragile new units and there it can, uh, severe burns can be a possibility. We yeah, have seen new units having burnt skin because of PTD. Yeah, but uh, more than 28 weeks, we, we still use. We still use PTD, yes. Yeah, so that is the point. So it is unity based, uh, unit based uh, policy. So in our unity names, we don't use betadine for less than 28 week babies. But yes, in bigger babies, bigger gestation, we do use, but yeah. with precaution. Yes. And we limit the area of use, right? Yes. First, we limit the amount and also limit the area. So we only choose the area of interest. So we don't yeah. use to, we don't like use the whole arm when we are putting a pick line in the upper limb. We just clean the area of interest in a circular fashion and not repeating where it has already been applied and uh, throwing the swab again and then taking another swab and then cleaning it in again a circular fashion from inside to outside. 
never from outside to inside. So I think these are, very, these are very important uh, points that we need to understand, as, especially as nursing officers, because doctors may still be making mistakes and nursing officers can really change the practices in the unit because they are mostly there at the bedside and they know uh, what is happening. So I think uh, we can always correct and we can always uh, interrupt a procedure and say that this is going wrong and this is not right. So there the role of checklists uh, goes a long way. So checklist before a procedure should always be implemented and uh, should should be must in any unit because it helps us remember the steps. We cannot remember all the steps at a time, especially when the child is sick, it is required in an emergency. So checklist should be there in place in all the units. And I hope as nurses, uh, we can do a good job in checklist and uh, implementation at the bedside. We have Dr. Kirti. Dr. Kirti, would you like to say something? Yeah, I am sorry, I just joined later. Um, but I think class B prevention and this bundle is very important, specifically in neonatology, because day in and day out, we are doing procedures. And if we do not follow uh, the proper steps, uh, sepsis is in inevitable. So I think... Uh, uh, one should always follow the, all the aseptic precautions. And uh, other than that, I, I, I'm sure you must have covered the clean the hub uh, principle yes. also in this. Yes. So that is yes. very important. Thank you. I think three, three things that we go with home today. One is hand hygiene. We don't forget hand hygiene anytime. We can always do extra hand hygiene, but definitely do hand hygiene when required. And uh, all the moments and steps of hand hygiene religiously so that it becomes our DNA. Uh, it becomes our um, you know routine and uh, we become experts of hand hygiene and second is scrub the hub we should never forget to scrub the hub for 15 seconds and dry for 15 seconds and the third is the use of bundles or checklists to implement the uh, collapse prevention uh, protocol in the units i think uh, these are the three points that i wish everyone uh, takes home yeah. dr manisha can we conclude the session Yes, please. Yes, please. I think we have uh, have had good discussion and the topic has been uh, clear, made clear to the audience. So um, thanks, uh, Dr. Deepika. And I request uh, Meena, madam, to give uh, the final uh, vote of thanks. Okay, so once again, thanks, uh, Dr. Manisha, Dr. Kirti, and Dr. Parul, and the um, uh, participant. And our guest today, Dr. Deepika, for this wonderful session. And you know, um, you have made it, this um, CLEPS is so complicated, but you have made it so simple and so, you know, um, learning was a fun. Yes, Sunatha, but today we have seen it. So thank you very much for sparing your time and, you know, teaching us about uh, CLEPSI. And we hope that. Soon we will be approaching you again for some of the other sessions. I will be more than Thanks. happy to discuss at this forum because I'm always happy to teach. Yeah, we will invite you as medical expert for our further future sessions as well. I'll be more so, than happy to come, Dr. Yeah. So just for your information, I, this session, this, this platform, we call the students who are doing fellowship, the nursing students who have joined for fellowship through NNF. And then they come and they present the topics over here and then there is discussions. And for each of those presentation, we have a medical and a nursing expert who oh. share their, uh, who give that's their a, a nice uh, approach that is being followed because student led discussions are very, very important. Yes. Confidence. Yes. Just, yeah. Just to give them confidence, make them read and, uh, you know, put up. and there is usually a lot of questions which come up during those discussions. But I believe today you, you have covered everything so well so there have been not uh, question, yeah. no questions from uh, the student learning is both ways yeah you know. so so anyway thank you very much for today's session thank yeah you. Thank, thank you so much thank you thank you, thank you.